hello awesome raptors and welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to introduce you to a new instrumental technique known as mass spectrometry or simply put mass spec or if you're looking in the literature you might see MS. Mass spectrometry is used to determine the mass of molecules, proteins, or elements. So if you're ever wondering how do we know that oxygen is 15.999 or how do we know that the mass of a protein is what it is, we use an instrumental technique known as mass spectrometry. For this video, I'm going to explain how mass spectrometry works in terms of its three-step process or similar three-step process. And we're going to look at a few different spectrum that might be produced from a mass spec and figure out how to analyze them for key features of a molecule. Let's get started. First, let's talk about what mass spectrometry is. Now, mass spectrometry has so many different TV, um, variations and changes. Um, in terms of how it's carried out or what process it might be. And that changes based on what I really want to acquire from it. Um, so I just want to go over the main three components that are associated with any mass um, spec that you might pick up or see in a lab. The first one is the first step is ionization. So the whole part of um, mass spec is to ionize whatever your sample is. Um, and the most common method for ionization is they'll bombard a sample with electrons. So then therefore um, it's going to um, kick a few off. So then it'll take on a positive charge. Um, and when we see a positively charged molecule or ion, we call that a cation. So the ionization process is to create a cation, a positive charge. That might be bombarding it with electrons. Um, it might be another way what they'll do um, is they have this way where they'll push the sample into such fine spray that it actually rips electrons off the molecule and creates positive cations. But there's several ways that you can do the ionization. The second part is that they're going to push those ions through a magnetic field. And the variation in that magnetic field causes the particles to sway left or right um, and deviate from the same path. So instead of all the molecules following the same path, they separate out um, and then they'll collide with a sensor. Um, to kind of help illustrate that, I just have a few little things here to kind of show you what I mean by that. So a magnetic field, right? We're going to add it here. I've got a sensor over here. Now, what happens is the molecule is going to come in through ionization. After ionization, it's going to have a positive charge and look like a cation. As it travels through the magnetic field, the magnetic field is going to deviate its path based on how big it is. And then it's going to be attracted to this negatively charged sensor plate where it collides. And the difference is based on size. So the bigger an object is, for example, right, we move these to the magnetic field, the more it's going to be deviated because the magnetic field is not going to impact this one as much because it's larger. Or this one, it's going to really deviate it because the size is much smaller. Um, and that's what we're talking about in terms of mass spec. And it'll hit a sensor and create a spectrum. And that spectrum is going to show you in relationship to mass to charge. So let's take a look at an example spectrum for chlorine. Now pay attention, chlorine I chose per, on purpose because chlorine is a diatomic, which means that you're not going to like pull a sample of air or wherever you might be finding chlorine gas, and it's not going to be just Cl by itself, it's going to be Cl2. If we look at the mass spec here, this is what the sensor outputs. Um, and you can see on the bottom of my x-axis axis is an mz ratio. The MZ is mass to charge ratio, which you can kind of think of as the mass of whatever the substance um, or whatever the molecule might be. It might be an atom or it might be a molecule. On the Y axis, I have relative intensity. And you can think about intensity as abundance. So intensity being how frequent does it happen or occur? So on this mass spec, I can see there are five peaks. One at 35, 37, 70, 72, and 74. Now these peaks are relating to the molecule. So remember, the molecule goes through ionization, it becomes charged, it moves through the magnetic field, and then it hits a sensor. Well, this is a molecule. So when it becomes charged, sometimes it'll stay together as Cl the entire time. If it does, that's where these peaks are coming from. 70, 72, 74. Well, chlorine's average average atomic mass is roughly 35 and a half, which is why we see peaks around 70, 72, and 74. That's the molecule staying together. So it didn't get actually separated during ionization. It stayed as one piece. Now, sometimes when it becomes ionized, um, that charge wants to be distributed very quickly through the molecule, so the molecule will separate and fragment. Um, and these two peaks are associated with fragmentation. 
So when I put Cl2 in there, it actually separates into two Cls, which is why I have 35 and 37. Now this also tells you a lot more. So you might ask, well, okay, if the average atomic mass of chlorine is 35 point or 34.5, why, or 35.5, apologies, can't remember, 35.5, why are there two peaks? And why are there three peaks here? Why isn't there just one peak and one peak? Um, and the reason is because of isotopes. So the average atomic mass of chlorine is 35.5 because some chlorines are 35, have a mass of 35, and some chlorines have a mass of 37. This is associated with abundance. So 35 is at roughly 80 intensity. So if I have a sample of chlorine, it's going to be a majority 35 chlorines, a mass of 35. If I have um, a mass of chlorine, some of it is going to also have a mass of 37. And that's where these peaks are coming from. So if both of the chlorines in the molecule are 35, then I get a peak of 70, um, 70 exactly, which makes sense because it's the one that's higher in abundance, which is why it's the higher one over here. So if I get a sample of chlorine, most of them are going to be chlorine 35s, which means they have a mass of 35. But some of the molecules might have a mass of 35 and a mass of 37, or they might have 237 chlorines, which is even lower probability um, of that occurring. Um, not probability, this is a sample that actually occurred. Um, so we can see here, based on this abundance, that's um, how a sample should look if I get chlorine somewhere. So remember, MC is mass to charge ratio, roughly the mass along the x-axis. Relative intensity is abundance. How frequent did that actually occur? Now let's take an example of how we could apply this to another mass spec. So here I have a mass spec of an unknown. I clearly distinctly have, well, you might not be able to see it on the camera, we'll see. Um, there are four peaks here, one at 20, two really tiny ones at 36 and 38, and one here right at 40. So I can see that the intensity is almost completely 40. So the abundance of whatever this atom is should be almost 40. So I pulled the closest elements on the periodic table that are close to 40. So our options are is this element could be argon, it could be potassium, or it might be calcium. Because all of their average atomic masses are really close to that 39, 40-ish range. Now the question is we need to be able to eliminate atoms. So the first one we should be able to eliminate really quickly is potassium. Potassium is 39.0, which means I should have a peak at 39, not 40. I have a peak at 40, so potassium is eliminated. Calcium and argon are a little trickier because they're only deviating by a tenth. So I've got 40 and I've got 39.9. How do I know if it's calcium versus argon? And the question is um, based on the intensity. Most of it is at 40. So I'm assuming that the intensity is exactly 40. Now, how do I know if it's slightly above 40 or slightly below 40? That's based on the other peaks. The only peaks on this spectrum are less than 40, 38, 36, and 20, which means that the average mass must be less than 40. It can't be higher because there are no peaks above 40. Therefore, it is argon. Now, that's very tricky, so you have to pay attention. This peak, that high intensity M plus peak, is going to tell you very quickly where you are on the periodic table. You need to use the other intensity peaks to determine which atom or element I actually am. So this is the um, aspect for argon. Now, let's take into account another example which is a molecule, um, a little more complicated than chlorine. So let's look at chloromethane. Chloromethane just means CH3Cl. And the mass spec looks like this, a little more complicated than the two we just looked at. I've got a lot of peaks going on. That's okay. We're only going to pay attention to a few of them. Um, so remember, I'm going to put this molecule through ionization. It's going to take on a positive charge, and then it's going to break apart. Now, we need to look at these peaks and figure out, well, okay, where is the actual molecule? Where is its fragmentations? What's happening? Now, um, all the examples I'm going to give you, I will either label, um, that's given to you in this course, is I will either label the M plus peak. So we haven't named this yet, but this high peak over here at 50 is called the M plus peak. It's the molecular ion peak, which is the mass of the molecule not broken apart. So 50 here, 
kind of hard to see with this little arrow that I made here. I apologize. 50 here is corresponding to this entire molecule stuck together. And these other variations are just different isotopes of C, H, and Cl, which is why I have a little bit of variance associated with um, these peaks. Oh, whoops, sorry, wrong one. CH3, Cl+. Plus. I just gave the answer away to one of them. That's okay. CH3, Cl+. Plus. So the ions stuck together. These two locations or concentrations are associated to something breaking off. Well, this is 35. Hmm, 35, 35. 35, what do I think I can break off that would leave a mass of 35? And what can I break off to leave a mass of subtly 15? Well, actually the CH3 and the CL split. So this is representative of chlorine. So when chlorine splits off by itself, I get CL over here. When CH3 splits off by itself, I get um, this peak over here, 15, which makes sense because it's 12, roughly 12, plus three for every hydrogen. So roughly about 15 assuming that the isotopes are the same. And of course, remember, these other little peaks around them are just associated with other isotopes of those actual atoms. Now, this also tells us something else very key. If there's a chlorine present, there will always be this relationship here because chlorine always has those two isotopes, 35 and 37. So I'm gonna have a big peak here of 50. That's when I have chlorine 35. When I have chlorine 37, it's going to be right down here at 52. So this relationship of a peak here and a peak that's about one third of the M plus peak, that associates that there is a chlorine present. Anytime I see that, that means a chlorine is present. Now, there are other uh, shortcuts that we can use when we look at a mass spec to figure out whether a chlorine is present, a bro bromine is present, or a nitrogen is present. Let's look at them. So let's clear this off. Now, chlorine, we just went over. If the M plus peak is three times higher than the M plus plus two peak, meaning two peaks past the M plus peak, three times bigger, a chlorine is present. That's because of that 35-37 relationship. The other one that we can look at is bromine. Well, bromine has two isotopes that are relatively equal in abundance, which is why if you look at a bromine molecule, um, and there'll be some examples in the practice problems, um, the M plus peak is identically in size or the same size as the M plus plus two peak, so two peaks ahead of it. That's because the bromine isotopes are roughly the same in abundance. And that shows presence of a, um, a bromine. The last one that I want you to be uh, aware of is if the M plus peak is odd, that means that nitrogen is present. Those are the three things that you need to be aware of when you're given a spectrum. So I might ask you, here's a spectrum, tell me if there's a chlorine present. I might give you a spectrum and ask if a bromine's present or if a nitrogen is present. You can also be able to identify the atom based on the actual ion peaks present. Great work, Lawson of Raptors. Now you understand that a mass spec is composed of these three items of ionization, um, I'm sorting by fragments due to a mass charge ratio, and then I'm getting some output. We even went over how you analyze that output based on intensity and abundance to determine what composition a molecule might have, as well as what the average atomic mass of an element might be. Great work. If you have any questions, please ask, reach out to your instructor. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in.